want you to try to imagine that you're sat in the waiting room of a clinic. It's unbearably hot and the air is still. There are easily a hundred people in the waiting room, all in line to see the triage nurse. But the staff don't appear to be talking to any of the patients in front of them. They're only really taking measurements. You know that it's the start of a long wait, and you feel anxious about having to describe what's wrong with you to the, the nurse. You're worried that they won't listen to you. Today, I want to talk about why, in research, listening is as important as measuring data points, why words are as powerful as numbers, and how, by creating space for people to describe their lives, we can avoid making assumptions that lead to poorly designed health programs. I work for the largest independent medical humanitarian organization in the world, Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders. We call it MSF for short. We have teams working in some of the most hostile environments, and I am part of a small technical unit that specializes in operational research to better inform how we provide that humanitarian assistance. Operational research is where each study is initiated by the real challenges that our colleagues are facing in providing assistance to populations in need. The purpose of the research is to inform concrete, actionable results that will affect change. And whilst most of our work is based on numbers, percentages, ratios or proportions, sometimes they don't tell you what you need to know. Sometimes to make sense of all of that data, we need to listen to people, we need to ask them different kinds of questions, and we need to understand what they say. And this is where I come in. I spend most of my time traveling to our projects just to sit and listen to people's stories, to learn from their lived experiences. And it's this methodology that gives people the space to describe their lives so that I can understand living them, understand their challenges and their ambitions, their fears and their hopes. So let me take you back to that clinic I asked you to imagine. In 2015, I was working in this clinic. It's in a small town in Unity State in South Sudan, a remote part of the world's youngest country. Now, after a period of relative calm, the security situation started to deteriorate. Tensions in the community were rising, and it was unclear how far this instability might extend. So to reduce the exposure of our patients in the clinic, we reduced our activities down to the bare minimum, the basic package of care. And we immediately moved out non-essential staff into a hospital about 100 kilometers away. The medical team there described some of the challenges that they were facing, treating patients who had been referred from other parts of the country. They were seeing non-compliance with treatment, refusal to undergo surgery, frustration and withdrawn, and slower recoveries than expected. So the team asked me to investigate to try and understand what was happening. Now, South Sudan is a multilingual country, and there are over 60 languages in use, but I don't speak any of them. And English is not widely spoken. So to make sure that I was collecting meaningful information, it was necessary to hire a translator. And together, side by side, we interviewed patients in every ward of the hospital. And the stories that they told us started to form a pattern. They too couldn't speak the languages of the clinic staff, so they didn't understand their diagnosis, their treatment, or their recovery. And until this point, they had felt that no one was listening to them. They wanted to be active participants in their road to recovery, not just passive recipients of care. 
And so, on the basis of these interviews, the team decided to hire more translators because they were committed to facilitating better communication in the clinic. They knew that this would ensure patients felt autonomy in their care. And ultimately, that would lead to better patient outcomes. So now I want to take you to a different waiting room. Imagine that you're a teenager and you're surrounded by adults. Everyone's talking about things you cannot relate to, and everyone looks really sick. It's both frightening and boring at the same time. And your mates are all messaging you, asking you where you are. But you can't tell them because they don't know that you're at, you're at an HIV clinic. MSF was finishing up a research project at an HIV clinic in Darwei, Myanmar, and I was asked to join for the data analysis phase of the project. The geek in me was so excited to get my hands on the collection of interview transcripts. Now, it's a struggle for many people to adhere to HIV treatment, and it's especially difficult for teenagers. But our clinic data indicated differently. We found that um, these teenagers were doing relatively well, and the team wanted to understand why. So the study explored what adolescents thought about their care. How did HIV fit into their lives outside of the clinic? And it was an unusual approach for us to have interviewed teenagers on an individual basis. And if we had only interviewed their primary caregivers or the clinic staff, we would have had very different results. They told us that they liked the way they were able to talk with the staff in the clinic. They felt listened to, supported, understood. And through the organized patient support groups, they had met other teenagers that felt the same way about HIV and their lives. And together they discussed their fears, their frustrations, and their futures. These exchanges helped them to validate that their feelings were real. By asking teenagers to describe their experiences, our research had found that this adapted approach to communicating with teenagers was working. It was the cornerstone to their successful adherence and essential to their continued engagement in care. Now, the last clinic I want to take you to is in the middle of the jungle. It's a single room made out of bamboo, palm tree leaves, and mud. You're alone with your child in the clinic. And the, the nurse is telling you how to give the treatment to your child. It's a bit confusing, but you think you've understood. So at the end of the consultation, you wrap up the pills in a piece of paper and you head home, hoping that you'll know what to do next. In the Northern Democratic Republic of Congo, we have a community-based approach to malaria management in children under the age of five. They're one of the most vulnerable groups. The team there was concerned that kids might not be taking their treatment properly. And so we conducted a brief literature review and discovered some of the reasons why this might be the case. Perhaps parents were saving the treatment for a future uh, illness. Maybe the kids were too sick to swallow. Or perhaps people preferred traditional approaches to healing. To find out what was going on, we sat in on the consultations in these tiny village clinics. We watched how children were being diagnosed, and we listened to what information was being exchanged. Then we followed up with interviews to see what happens when patients head home. We heard from all stakeholders that they care very deeply about the, the health of these kids. But it was through the observations in the clinics that we discovered a fundamental step is missing. The information exchange was really only in one direction. Parents weren't being given an opportunity to ask questions. And the clinicians weren't checking that the parents had understood how to give the medication to their children. For us, this had really important implications 
for how to improve the healthcare services that we provide in this remote part of the world. We need to foster an environment of positive communication, not just one directional conversations. For medical research and public health programming to be effective, we need to engage meaningfully with the patients that we intend to assist. We need to ask our patients about their opinions, to share their experiences. And we need to, in research, be open to surprises and to check our assumptions. And we need to respond to those identified needs with adapted, appropriate approaches to healthcare. Listening, I believe, is a critical skill at every stage of this exchange, be it between the study population and the researcher, or between the healthcare worker and the patient. Because some things you will only ever know if someone tells you, and sometimes they'll only tell you if you're prepared to listen. Thank you very much. <laughs>